So, good morning. Uh, welcome to those who just arrived this morning. Uh, I could see some of our distinguished guests that I'm very happy to see this morning. And I hope that you enjoyed the program yesterday. And uh, I hope it's going to be the same for the coming two and a half days. Uh, I will go quickly with some uh, updates on information before leaving the stage to Professor Sabu Thomas. And again, about the presentation, and if you haven't already give your to the staff, please think of uh, going to the room and uh, uploading your presentation. And uh, also, we have set up something on streaming to let people outside of this audience to follow the plenary lecture online. And it has been successful yesterday, from what I understand. And uh, we're going to do the same today. And you could use this link that will be, you may have received this by email already. You can uh, use in your universities or institute and people can see what you are doing here online and on time. So the registration for the tour, technical tours, I remind you, we have two technical tours, West Energy Plant from uh, Suez, Norvegian, Toulouse, and the landfill biogas uh, plant nearby. And uh, the deadline for registration is today. And if you're interested to do this, you have your own account. You can connect to the West End with login with your account, and then you can uh, register online. And uh, we're going to stop it tonight because of uh, security checks that the company needs. We are not going to be able to do it tomorrow. Please make sure that. If you are interested, uh, go online, please, and make your registration. And uh, again, for Thursday and Friday, as I made the announcement yesterday, we're going to provide the shuttle bus to bring you back to the airport. And uh, there's a list outside displayed in the board, or you can talk to the reception desk to register if you are interested to benefit from these services. There's a uh, we are the Caldemin, as you know. There's uh, some labs. Among those, there's a research center on particulate solid, energy and environment, where I belong to, and I'm also the director of this research center, uh, composed of uh, about under 10 persons. We have uh, quite good facilities, and we would like to arrange a visit on Thursday afternoon, right after the conference. If you are interested to visit our facility here, we can arrange uh, an half an hour tour. It's going to be quick, but concentrate on the activities linked with this conference. And again, if you are interested by doing this visit, and there is a list open at the registration desk. Uh, you could register and we, we will arrange the visit uh, Thursday afternoon, right after the conference. And the last thing, and as you some of you have been asking me already, that's why I added this slide. We have had a couple of West End issues already. As you could see in uh, the screen, uh, we have a biannual conference. The first one was here in 2005 in the same room. 2008 in Patras, chaired by my friend and uh, colleague, Professor Libertas. And uh, in between, we organized some topical issue. We had one in uh, Africa, in Ouagadougou, on plastic and wastewater treatment. But of course, this one, the special issue is small, like 50 persons. And then we moved to Beijing in 2010. And in between, we co-organized with American Chemical Society, a joint symposium, during the annual meeting of SES in San Francisco. It was in 2010 and with American Institute of Chemical Engineering in Joint Symposium uh, that I chair with uh, Marco Castaldi, who was in Chicago in 2011. Small extent, but uh, good enough to advertise the topic. And then 2012, in Porto, chair with uh, Professor uh, Fernando Castro. Fernando is somewhere here. And uh, 2014 in Rio, uh, here we are, 2006. Uh, 
since some people were asking me to welcome the condition to welcome the next one, I just had some um, information here. If you're interested to welcome the next, just let us know. You can send us an email and we can discuss. Uh, the idea in the beginning was having one issue in Europe and the next outside of Europe. This, that's the way it has worked so far. But uh, this is the principle, but in, and there is a reality. And the reality is the person who is going to handle the project. That's the most important, because you need to put it in our right, right hands and to keep making progress. That's why, if you're interested, I know that some of you have already asked, please let us know and to make something formal. And everything is open, there is no commitment, and we can discuss. Okay, uh, I'm done with this, uh, Nicola. Uh, now I'm going to introduce our speaker for this morning. And uh, the plenary lecture will be delivered by Professor Sabu Thomas from uh, University of Mahatma Gandhi in uh, India. Sabu is uh, one of uh, the most productive uh, scientists I, I, I know so far, because uh, they have developed quite outstanding research on developing nanomaterials from, uh, let's say, natural resources that could be biomass mainly. And uh, we've um, a very interesting approach of uh, developing those nanomaterials for a very wide range of applications. And uh, is based on uh, Kerala, uh, Madma Gandhi, and chairing the um, Department of Polymer Engineering Science, chairing also the Enter University Center on Nanomaterials. He has published more than 650 papers, it's amazing, wrote about uh, more than 10 books. And uh, I was expecting to have Sabu here uh, for a long time ago for the previous issue. We couldn't make it. That's why I'm so glad you could accept to address the audience and share your tremendous experience with us. Thank you, Sabu. Please welcome Professor Sabu. Thank you. Very good morning to all of you. Thank you, Asha, for the kind words. I'm really excited to be over here. An exciting place, an exciting conference. I really learned a lot. And I'd love to probably host sometime one of these meetings back in, in Kerala, in my university. And I'm sure I'll be excited to do that. So what I'm going to do today is uh, you know, take you to um, uh, some of the work we have done uh, in my group in Mahatma Gandhi University in Kerala uh, to extract nanomaterials from biological resources, especially biomass. And uh, as Ashi mentioned, I am located at um, the southern part of India. We have a center for nanoscience and nanotechnology. I'm also part of chemistry faculty there. And if you, look at the, uh, if you look at the solid waste uh, on a global perspective, uh, you can see that we produce something like 1.3 billion tons of solid waste annually. That's something like 1.2 kilogram per person. If you look at the situation 10 years ago, it's something like 0.68 tons produced 10 years ago. We have almost doubled now. Look at the Indian scenario. Indian scenario is also not very different. We produce something like 36.5 million tons of municipal waste annually. And if you look at the per capita, uh, municipal waste is something like 0.2 to 0.6 kilogram. If you, if you look at the, uh, the sustainability of our mother earth, I mean, these waste really affects the human health, uh, animal health, I mean, climate, if you don't handle them carefully. And if, I'm sure some of you, or all of you must know that nanomaterials are quite fascinating. Materials, they, are, they have lots of application in medicine, in energy, in environment, and advanced manufacturing process. And we have a variety of nanoscopic materials, carbon nanotube, uh, graphene, I mean, uh, metal oxides. And if you look at all these materials, you will find that these are mainly produced from non-renewable resources. And sometimes they create hazardous waste. So my interest is to, to, to make use of the biomass uh, and nanotechnology and uh, the principles of green chemistry to make 
bio nanomaterials to, uh, to protect our ecosystem. So I'm going to focus today on how we can convert the, bio, uh, the, the biological waste into exciting nanomaterials. If you look at the global production of, uh, production of agro waste, is something like 1.6 billion tons. And we are not really making use of these materials effectively. Countries like Brazil, India, we produce lots of agro waste. When you look at the agro waste, we have sugarcane, bagasse, wheat bran, you can see a range of materials, beautiful materials. And if you use them, I mean, using green chemistry, using nanoscience and nanotechnology, we can make a wonderful, exciting materials. If you look at the plant kingdom, the lots of, I mean, plant waste materials, starting from wood is the top, the, 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 the maximum, followed by bamboo, cotton, jute, canaf, you have a range of plant material. They are very exciting materials. And if you look at these plant fibers, they are environmentally friendly materials, cost effective, abundant, non-abrasive to machineries. There are lots and lots of positive points. Societal need, underutilized, and if you look at this plant kingdom, we have beautiful fibers, uh, bass fibers, or leaf fibers, or seed fibers, or grass fibers. And if you look at um, uh, my, my interest, you know, we work quite a lot on banana plants. We go to the banana plantation and collect all this banana stalk and dry it and make use of this material for extracting nanofibers. Oil palm, we have a big industry of oil palm in the country. We have pineapple quite a lot. Coconut, Kerala is actually land of coconut trees. That's the meaning of Kerala. So these materials are fascinating. And you can extract them by, by different ways, by mechanical ways, you can extract these fibers. But very often you damage them uh, when you extract mechanically. You can also use for biological retting process, you can get good quality fibers. And if you look at the uh, employment potentiality, you know, create lots of rural jobs, renewable resources, you can make biodegradable plastics out of it. There are quite a lot of positive points. And if you look at the price of this material, taking cotton as an index of 100, you will find that these materials are relatively cheap. The Indian market, a kilo of uh, coir fiber costs something like 20 rupees. Uh, I mean, uh, 0.3 or 0.4, uh, I mean, uh, dollars. Look at the mechanics. If you look at the mechanical properties of this fiber, they are exciting. Uh, the, uh, the, the specific properties are very good because the density of these fibers are 1.5, 1.25, so they give very good mechanics. As good as glass fibers if you look at the, the specific properties. Look at the chemistry of this material. This is basically, uh, it is actually cellulose, 60% of cellulose. Coir is something like 45% of cellulose. It's a fascinating molecule. You can do a lot of chemistry on this. A fascinating hydroxyl groups. Then you have hemicellulose and lignin. And if you look at the plant fiber on a macroscopic point of view, you can work in different length scale. You can work on macro length scale. In the beginning, you know, I was cleaning this fiber, chopping into smaller length and put into polypropylene and making a lot of work with many industries. You can also work in micro scale and you can also work in nano length scale. There are a lot of possibilities with these fibers. And I will, I'm asking a question, why nanocellulose? Nanocellulose has a lot of possibilities. For example, water holding capacity, uh, crystalline material, high tensile strength, the lower density, high specific strength and modulus. Uh, I mean, uh, this is a very important statement I wanted to make. These are our strategic platform for sustainable development. One of the most fascinating nanomaterial is nanocellulose because it's renewable, I mean, eco-friendly, there are different ways you can make them. You can make them by acid hydrolysis, by steam explosion process, high intensity ultrasonication process, grinding, cryo crushing, uh, freeze, uh, I mean, uh, high pressure homogenization. There are a variety of techniques you can make these materials. And if you look at high pressure homogenization process, what you really do is you pass a slurry through a small I mean, orifice, and because of sheer forces, you can, you can, you can make them into nanoscale. Super grinding, you grind, you, uh, I mean, using uh, two stones, you can make quite fascinating nanomaterials. 
You can use cryo crushing, you cool it liquid nitrogen and you grind it. You can also make beautiful nanostructures. High intensity ultrasonication process is also a good way to make nanocellulose. Steam explosion process, uh, we have been practicing steam, steam explosion process quite a lot. What you do is you, uh, you put in an autoclave and you pressurize the system in the alkaline condition. The temperature is between 100 and 150 degrees Celsius and the pressure is uh, something like, um, I mean, 150 Pascal and then you release the pressure suddenly, you can open up the cellulose. And you can also use acid hydrolysis. Look at this, this is actually a wood flower and you do an alkali treatment, you have a slurry, you remove lignin and hemicellulose and you go for a hydrolysis, uh, acid hydrolysis, you get beautiful nanoscale materials. You can also make two types of uh, material. One is the so-called nanofibers. Look at the nanofibers. Uh, if, you do, if you use a mild acid, you can make long nanocellulose. If you use a strong acid, you can break all this amorphous part and you can make short nano viscous. So you have different possibilities, either a long nanofiber or a visker. If you look at the mechanics of this material, I mean, it's very, very interesting. Look at this. The, the modulus is 130 gigapascal and the mechanical the strength is, tensile strength is 10 gigapascals. Look at low cost, regular shape. There are a lot of uh, uh, fascinating properties. This is something reported in literature. You can see the preparation of cellulose nanocrystal by acid hydrolysis. A strong acid has been utilized, and you can see beautiful nanocrystals. And the yield depends upon the, the origin, what you're using. If you're using, I mean, a pineapple leaf fiber, I get something like 35% of nanocellulose. If you look at the work of Dufresne, you know, in France, he has actually extracted a nanoscale material from a variety of sources. Uh, a wheat straw, coat and sugar beet pulp, squid pen, reefia tubes, crab shell if you use, you can get nano chitin, waxy maize, you can make nano starch. So they are actually exciting materials. And another important point is when you put them into plastics, when you put them into rubber, so when you put them into latex, the advantage is they percolate and form a sort of network structure because the presence of hydroxyl groups. And you can immobilize the macromolecules and you can get very good stiffness. That's the beauty of putting nanoscale materials into polymers. Look at this nice work. If you look at the dynamic modulus, uh, I mean, putting into nanoscale material into rubber latex, and if you put a very small amount of nanoscale material, nanocellulose, you can see a percolating effect that the modulus shoots up. Similarly, if you look at the conductivity, by coating, I mean, um, nanocellulose with polypyrrole, you can see the conductivity jumps up because they form a percolated network structure. If you look at the mechanics of this material, because this is widely used for reinforcing polymers, look at the neat latex. This is the, uh, the sustained behavior of neat rubber. And when, when you, when you put, uh, if you put 6% uh, of nanocellulose, you can see the rubber is transformed into a high modulus material. So you can get very high strength material by putting nanocellulose. If you look at the dynamic modulus, dynamic properties, this is actually neat uh, rubber. This is 1% of nanocellulose, this is 3%, this is 5%, this is 10%. If you put 10% of nanocellulose, you get real solid-like material. And you can see the temperature utility of the material, you can go up to 500 degree Kelvin. But if you look at the neat rubber, you cannot use beyond 300. So you can make real, real solid uh, material by putting this nanoscale uh, cellulose. So what we have in my university, we have a very small system. This is actually the, the raw fiber we collect from the plantation. We have a autoclave, we do a steam explosion process, and we do a acid hydrolysis, and finally we get beautiful uh, nanostructures. Look at the dynamics of the enrichment process. If you look at the raw fiber, the cellulose content is something like 64% for banana uh, fiber. And if you do a steam explosion process and a bleaching process, you can increase the cellulose content dramatically because you remove lignin and hemicellulose. This is something we recently did with pineapple leaf fiber, one of my students. He's now a postdoc in Israel. He, he actually extracted uh, nanoscale material from banana stock. So we have a lot of activity producing nanomaterial from different uh, biological waste materials. This is something we have done with the Swedish group. We have extracted quite nanoscale material from the wood. You can see uh, beautiful nanoscale material from the teak wood. 
This is from pineapple leaf fiber. This is an ESEM of a pineapple leaf fiber, something we did with, uh, in cooperation with Brazil. We can also do a lot of chemistry on this uh, nanoscale materials. For example, you can do uh, grafting on the surface. You can do tempo oxidation process. You can do esterification process. You can do cationization process. You can do cellulation process. And you can really change the properties of the material depending upon the matrix you want to use, depending upon the type of system you want to manufacture. And my group is quite active in making use of this material for own healing applications, water purification, sensors, EMI shielding. You can do lots of nice things with this material. Look at water purification process. I have a massive project on water purification process using nanoscale material. What we have done is we have made a sort of uh, uh, four-layer system, uh, so three-layer system. The base is actually a, a non oven microfiber support. This could be made by PVA or PEO or PAN. And then what you do is you make a nano uh, cellulose nanofiber coating, and finally you give a hydrophilic coating on the surface. And if you make such a such a uh, such a uh, I mean a filter. Uh, you can use this filter for removing dyes, nanoparticles, heavy metal ions, oils, and bacteria, and viruses. I can show you something we did recently. We have removed the, the, uh, the, the, the crystal violet dye from textile industry. What we have done is we made use of a PBDF support, the base support, and then we have given a coating of nanocellulose over the PBDF. And what we have done is we also did a little, little bit of chemical modification on the nanocellulose using meldrum acid. So you can introduce um, a negative charge on nanocellulose. And then what we got, uh, actually, look at this figure. This is actually the removal of uh, the dye as a function of time. This is a PVDF membrane alone. And this is uh, uh, coating with nanocellulose surface on the PVDF. And this is actually modified nanocellulose with uh, meldrum acid. You will find that the modified meldrum acid modified nanocellulose is much more uh, superior than uh, uh, the, the niche system. So uh, we got really exciting results. Uh, this is actually the mechanism. This is our, uh, our, uh, our system. The bottom is actually the PVDF, and the top is um, uh, the, uh, the modified nanocellulose. This is the crystal violet dye. And you can see that there's interaction between the, the crystal violet and the nanocellulose, the electrostatic interaction. And we could remove this dye beautifully. If you look at some of the work reported by Maya et al., if you look at this, uh, beautifully they've shown that nanocellulose uh, as a filter is much more efficient than uh, conventional filters for removing uh, different types of dyes. We also made use of uh, these uh, filters for removing nanoparticles. What we have done is uh, we have dispersed, I mean, ferric oxide nanoparticles in water, and then we try to remove these ferric oxide nanoparticles. This is actually a bed of nanocellulose, and the bottom layer is uh, PVDF, and you can see we could really remove the, uh, uh, the nanoparticles very efficiently. And uh, if you look at this uh, the top surface of the, the filter, after uh, removing the nanoparticle, you can see lots of nanoparticles are stuck on the top surface of the filter. And this is the bottom surface, which is actually made of um, a PVDF membrane. And this was actually our feed solution. Uh, the, this was the feed solution. This was, uh, I mean, uh, the transmission, transmittance was almost zero. Once you remove the nanoparticle, you have 100% transmittance. So we proved that this could be a good, good filter for removing nanoparticles. We, also, the, 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 we are also quite active, pro, we have also quite active program going on on removing oil. If you look at this, the, the work in the Finnish group, what they've done is they've made use of nanocellulose for, for cleaning, uh, I mean, um, the water. So what they've done is they made an aerogel with the nanocellulose and gave a coating with, um, with, this, with, with the titanium dioxide. This is actually aerogel of nanocellulose coated with titanium dioxide. When you give a titanium dioxide coating, the surface becomes extremely hydrophobic. And therefore, the hydrophobic surface can take up all the oil. So if you just float in the sea, these nanocellulose can absorb all the oil and you can take out the oil or you can burn the oil. So this is actually fascinating material for uh, uh, for removing oil from water. 
And if you look at the, if you look at the high resolution microscopic picture of this aerogel, you can see this structure of the aerogel this is extremely porous. And you can also see that this is the coating with titanium dioxide. This is actually a nanocellulose, and this is the coating of na uh, titanium dioxide. That gives rise to the hydrophobicity to the system. You can also make use of uh, this material for removing heavy metal absorption. What is shown over here is there's a bed of, there's a filter of nanocellulose, which has been chemically modified with the polyvinyl amine. And you can see you can remove, uh, you can remove chromium ion beautifully by using this filter. Similarly, you can also make use of uh, this filter for removing nickel, removing cadmium, or removing, uh, I mean, uh, lead. What is shown over here, there are three types of filters. This is actually raw straw fiber without any modification. And this is actually uh, the, uh, the cellulose filters. This is a macrocellulose. This is a nanocellulose. So the nanocellulose is much more efficient because surface area is so high. So you can remove nickel or cadmium or lead, such ions, because this nanocellulose has a negative charge so that it can, uh, it can attract most of the, uh, these, uh, uh, I mean, uh, metal ions. You can also remove virus and bacteria using this uh, nanocellulose. Uh, what you have to do is you again make a, a membrane, which is uh, the, the, the bottom one is PVDF, that you give a coating with nanocellulose. Oh, and when you, when, you pass, uh, when you pass this solution containing bacteria, you can catch up both the, most of the bacteria and viruses. If you want to, uh, I mean, remove virus because it's extremely small, what you do is you give a chemical treatment with the polyvinylamine. That will give rise to uh, a positive charge on the, uh, on the nanocellulose, and therefore you can catch most of the, uh, most of the uh, bacteria and viruses. So this is a beautiful filter. You can also use this nanocellulose for uh, wound healing application. You can see a patient suffering from high degree of, uh, uh, I mean, wound. And you can make use of uh, this as a scaffold. Therefore, uh, the, uh, the healing process becomes faster because the uh, nanocellulose is extremely porous. We have done quite nice, some nice work with the Brazilian group to make some hot wall. What we have done is we have incorporated poly, uh, nanocellulose into polyurethane. This is a neat medical grade polyurethane. The strength is 17.5. If you put 5% of nanocellulose, you can see the strength goes up, and the modulus improves dramatically, 99.992.4. And we have made, uh, I mean, two types of processes. One is the heart valve with the Brazilian group. We also made a, a, a vascular process for, uh, uh, for a bronchocephalic trunk. Uh, this we initially did a lot of animal uh, trials and finally we could succeed to make uh, these implants. Nanocellulose is also a wonderful material for wound healing application. This is actually a wound. You can, you can cast a film of nanocellulose and this could actually cover this wound and you can have very fast wound healing application. You can also use uh, uh, nanocellulose if you make an aerogel of nanocellulose and you can incorporate antibiotic into it and then can use it for own healing application. What is shown over here, here is the cumulative release of the antibiotic. So it's a very fascinating system for, uh, uh, for uh, drug release. You can also use the system for, uh, uh, I mean, aerogel for uh, uh, own healing application. This is something, uh, the work of uh, uh, Chonko et al., what they have done is they have introduced collagen into nanocellulose, and they made a uh, aerogel, and this aerogel is extremely nice for uh, wound healing applications. Nanocellulose also provide a lot of mechanical stability. I can show you one example. If you look at the, uh, if you look at the electrospan, electrospan pan fiber, you can see the electrospan fan fi uh, PAN fiber has, d d do not have much of mechanical strength. Suppose if you do a coating with nanocellulose on one side, you can see the mechanical strength increases. If you do a double side coating with nanocellulose on the PAN fiber, there is enhancement in mechanical strength. You can also use this for uh, sensor applications. I can show you a couple of examples. This is actually nanocellulose and carbon nanotube together. You mix with the rubber latex, natural rubber latex, and you make a nanocomposite which has both nanocellulose and carbon nanotube. 
The beauty is if you put uh, if you put nanocellulose in water, you see beautiful suspension you get. You get a very nice suspension. If you put carbon nanotube in water, and if you keep it for 24 hours, it settles down. But if you if you make a blend of carbon nanotube and CNC together, you can stabilize and you get a beautiful dispersion. And you can also see what you have done with natural rubber. If you put ca carbon nanotube in natural rubber, you cannot disperse them. There's a lot of agglomeration process. If you make a mixture of carbon nanotube and I mean uh, nanocellulose together in natural rubber, you get beautiful uh, dispersion. And you can see what we have done is, uh, well, so what this group done is, if you look at the conductivity of this material, uh, I mean, this is actually CNT volume fraction. If you look at the percolation process, this is natural rubber matrix. In order to get percolation, you have to add more than 7% uh, percent of volume percent of uh, carbon nanotube. But if you make a mixture of carbon nanotube and, uh, I mean, a cellulose nanofiber, you can push the percolation threshold to very low concentration, and you can make conductive, um, uh, conductive natural rubber. If you look at the mechanics of this system, uh, where you have a combination of CNT and, and uh, CNC together, you can see the strength is very high, the modulus is very high. But if you, if you make use of only carbon nanotube, you cannot disperse them in natural rubber latex. So the combination can uh, give rise to beautiful dispersion. Similarly, you can also make use of this material for strain sensing application. Uh, this is a natural rubber matrix. If you have a combination of CNT and CNC together in natural rubber, if you, if you stretch it, you know what happened? If the, the network is destroyed and you can see the, the, the resistance increases. So you can use uh, this material, the combination of CNT and CNC for manufacturing of beautiful uh, uh, strain sensing sensors. You can also use this material for a chemical sensor. Look at this is actually a combination of nanocellulose and graphene oxide. Again, you put into natural rubber latex and you make a percolating network of uh, graphene in natural rubber latex. And this is a combination of CNC and nanocellulose and graphene oxide. If you use only graphene oxide, you cannot disperse them into natural rubber. If you use a combination of these two, you get a beautiful dispersion. And you look at this electrical conductivity of the material. This is natural rubber matrix. If you use, if you use uh, I mean, uh, reduced graphene oxide alone, you see the percolation is something like um, 1.3 or 1.4. But you use a combination of um, uh, graphene oxide and nanocellulose, you can push the percolation to a lower concentration. You can also see the mechanics. You get really beautiful mechanical strength if you use a combination of nanocellulose and um, uh, RGO together. You can also make beautiful uh, sensors out of it, basically to, to sensing uh, solvents. This is actually a natural rubber nanocomposite uh, consisting of uh, reduced graphene oxide and nanocellulose together. If you expose to toluene, natural rubber likes toluene, and you can see the, the, the rubber expands and the network is destroyed. That is why the re resistance goes up. And then when you remove the solvent, it goes down. So it's actually, uh, I mean, uh, the responsivity is very high. You can see that this is actually uh, the five immersion cycle. This is the first cycle. The resistance goes up when the solvent goes in. When the solvent goes out, it comes back. Again, it goes up. So the, uh, we can use it as a beautiful sensor. And I also want to tell you that if you use different solvents, for example, if you use uh, toluene, if you use acetone, if you use uh, chloroform, depending upon the interaction parameter, uh, this, this, this acts as a good sensor for toluene and chloroform. It cannot act as a good sensor for DMF and acetone because the, the solubility parameter of uh, DMF and acetone is so different from natural rubber. So you can make you, this is a sensor for detecting solvents. Very recently, what we have done is uh, we have combined nanocellulose with uh, graphene oxide composite. This is actually nanocellulose fiber. We decorated with, uh, I mean, uh, graphene oxide, which is uh, modified with ammonia. You can see that this is the nanocellulose, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the dielectric constant of nanocellulose. But if you decorate with um, uh, graphene oxide, you can see the, the, uh, the uh, 
the dielectric constant jumps up. Uh, this has got a lot of beautiful applications. We have also a lot of interest to make energy storage applications. I can tell you some story. This is aerogel for energy storage application. You make an aerogel of um, nanocellulose, and then you burn uh, at high temperature. You get a char of, uh, I mean, nanocellulose, and this could be a beautiful uh, material for uh, uh, for anode material for lithium-ion batteries. So this is, this is quite, quite porous material. Similarly, you can also make use of this material for um, uh, energy storage applications. What has been done here is um, you have a blend of CNT and nanocellulose together. You go, go for a vacuum filtration process and you make a bed of CNT and CNC. Again, what you do is uh, you introduce silica, CNT, and CNC together and you can make beautiful, flexible silica anode because the top surface is actually silica. This is extremely flexible, and this could be a fascinating material for, uh, uh, for uh, electrode for lithium ion batteries. You can also make use of this material for EMI shielding application. So what is shown over here is uh, this is a multi-wall carbon nanotube and, uh, with a stabilizer. Uh, then you you mix with um, nanocellulose, and then you go for a freeze drying process. At the end, what you really get is you have CNT, uh, nanocellulose, freeze dried system. This is actually very nice for EMI shielding applications. So, uh, Anshi and I have a joint student. We have uh, lots of interest to make EMI shielding material for combining uh, nanocellulose and uh, CNT together. We can also make electrodes for supercapacitors. What you do is, the first slide is actually uh, cellulose microfiber, and then you make use of a conducting polymer. You do an in-situ polymerization process, and you can make freestanding pedal bulk paper, which is extremely conductive. Similarly, if you make use of nanocellulose, this is actually microcellulose. If you use nanocellulose, you can make extremely flexible nanopaper. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of fascinating application for supercapacitors. We are also quite active in the area of uh, chitin materials. Uh, chitin is a fascinating molecule, very similar to uh, cellulose, but we have NSCO CS3 group. And you can make uh, chitin crystals or chitin fibers. If you use a mild acid, you get uh, chitin fibers. If you, get, if you use a strong acid, you can get chitin nanoviscous. And you can see the, the nanoviscous produced by a strong acid hydrolysis. And this is nanofibers. And this, these are also fascinating material for a water purification process. Look at the infrared spectrum of the neat uh, chitin whisker. You can modify with an amino acid, and uh, you can introduce an amide linkage. And this could be very, very fascinating material for arsenic removal. You can remove arsenic using this bed of uh, uh, nanochitin. Similarly, you can also modify this, um, this um, nanochitin. What you do is you introduce um, aliphatic chains on the surface of this nanochitin, so you can make it hydrophobic. And this hydrophobic material could be very useful as a thickener for uh, oils and the food industry. Look at this. If you look at this, this is actually, uh, uh, this is actually nanochitin, which is uh, hydrophilic. If you introduce hydrophobic uh, alkyl groups, you can make it hydrophobic. And you can see the contact angle uh, goes up. This is the varying concentration of the, the, the side group, which is uh, hydrophobic. If you put into water, you can see uh, nanovisca forms a very nice dispersion, but the, the modified material, which hydrophobic groups, form lots of agglomerates because it cannot, it, it doesn't like water. That's why you have a lot of agglomerates. Towards the last phase of my lecture, we are also making use of the, the waste from agro-waste, where you get, you know, different types of starch materials. And uh, tapioca, there's actually a big production in Kerala, and we have a lot of waste of tapioca. So what we do is, again, you go for an acid hydrolysis process, and we are able to make uh, beautiful nanocrystals. And you can see these are some uh, beautiful nanocrystals made by Dufresne group from potato. We also made similar structure from tapioca. And uh, these are also nice uh, crystalline materials. If you put into 
polymeric matrices, you get exciting, uh, I mean, uh, reinforcing ability. You can see what you have done quite recently is uh, we, have, uh, we have taken natural over latex and we have loaded with um, uh, nano starch. You can see the neat natural over has a strength of something like 2 megapascals or 3 megapascal, and you can get up to 14 megapascal by putting this uh, nanoscale starch materials. And finally, I wanted to conclude that agro waste could be, a, could be transformed into advanced functional green materials. Uh, if you look at cellulose, you have beautiful nano viscous and nano cellulose, and uh, it could be utilized for uh, reinforcing agent for polymers, water purification purposes, wound healing applications, energy storage, EMI shielding applications. If you look at chitin, you can make chitin nanofibers or chitin nanoviscous. Again, a reinforcing material for polymers. You can use it for water purification, tissue engineering. And if you look at nanostarch, a beautiful material for uh, reinforcing polymers and for packaging applications. And I'm posing a question, can we become a zero waste globe? And I'd like to thank my co-workers. They contributed for this work, Lali, Vishak, Bibin. Uh, thankful to Professor Sina Rao for, for the nano mission funding. And many thanks to all the funding agencies in the country. I also got industrial funding. And uh, my collaborator from Plaskini, uh, Matthew from Sweden, you from South Brittany, Professor Kenny from Perugia. And we have started a good cooperation with ASHE. We have a joint PhD student. I'm sure that the coming years will have a lot of results. This is my group in chemistry. I have two groups. This is my group in chemistry. You can see my collaborator from France, uh, Yves Grohens. So we have a lot of cooperation with uh, Yves. This is my nano group uh, in, the, in the nano science uh, center. This is my joint director of the, of, the, of the nano group. And I'm from this part of the region, Kerala. Uh, this is extremely green. The temperature is always between 25 to 36 around the year. No winter at all. We get very nice fish. We have beautiful mountains here. So it's a very fascinating place to visit. This is Delhi. It takes three hours to reach Delhi. Uh, this is again a map of Kerala. You can see this is my city, Kottayam. And we have actually, Kerala is known as a Gorson country. So if you have every reason to visit this region. We have. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, beautiful uh, dance of the young girls. <laughs> we, have, we have very nice houseboat, uh, boat competition. This is our backwaters like in Venice. Uh, we have very old temples. This is actually a Kathakali. Very, uh, I actually actually uh, seen this Kathakali performance. And this is my university. Uh, we have actually a big university. This is the main campus of the university. We have School of Chemistry and Nanoscience. In chemistry, we have polymer organic, inorganic, and physical. And we have organized a conference, actually, international conference on polymer processing and characterization. Uh, it is in uh, December 9 to 11, 2016. If you have any possibility, you're most welcome to our, uh, to our region. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. Thank you for this uh, tremendous presentation. It's amazing to see how we can do with these nanomaterials and uh, the expand of possibilities uh, really great. And I confirm, I've been in Kerala, it's a lovely place. You should go, I invite you to go. So we have time for questions since uh, we are on time. And, uh, please go. Thank you for the presentation, Marco Castaldi from City College, uh, New York. That was uh, fascinating, all of the uh, different functions that the uh, material can have. The one thing I was trying to understand was the stress-strain relationships that you were showing. And one of the last ones that you had shown was the coatings on one side or the other side. And I'm just wondering, is the performance change that you're seeing because you are making them thicker with this material. And so then you're getting that stress strain relationship because it's a thicker material. And, and I'm curious as to how the nanocellulose actually tries to make that performance change. Very interesting question. 
very interesting question, actually. The, the reason for such a fascinating improvement in the strength and modulus is to the fact that when you put these nanoscale materials into polymers, you know what they do? They percolate. And you have a very strong network in the polymer matrix. And you immobilize the macromolecular chains. We did a lot of NMR studies, and we found that the polymer chains are sort of immobilized in the network. Their mobility is dramatically reduced. That's why you get these fascinating properties. This is basically because of network formation by cellulose. You don't get this much of network in carbon nanotube. You don't get in graphene. That's the fascinating property of these wonderful biological materials. They have beautiful hydroxyl groups. They form a network. And if you destroy these hydroxyl groups by chemical treatment, you don't see this sort of improvement in the mechanics. So, so it seems that it's perhaps the polar nature of the uh, cellulose that you're using is maybe causing this? Yeah, actually, this particular case, we have made use of, we have made use of uh, nano-whiskers. We have made use of nano-whiskers. They form a network, beautiful network. And uh, polymer chains are uh, attached to this network. So they are sort of immobilized. So the TG has been increased dramatically. You know, the TG of uh, rubber is something like minus 70 degree Celsius, and you just you just gone up to 40, 50, you know. So you immobilize. Sometimes, very interesting question, sometimes we, we saw two relaxation process. One is the relaxation of the original rubber, which is something like minus 70 for natural rubber. And we saw relaxation at very high temperature. That means that lots of macromolecules have been immobilized by this network. Thank you. Please. I'm a chemical engineer, so I, I, I've enjoyed the creativity here, but I, I keep have, must ask myself, how much does it cost? So you, yes. at, at the beginning, yes. you outlined six different right. preparation ways. Right. Have, you, right. have you costed those to see at what cost you can produce each of the these cost materials of, we so, have, that, we so have. that you can enter the markets that you would like to market. So this, this can actually be a reality. So can, can you talk about cost a little bit? Right. The cost of nanocellulose we extracted from banana fiber, it cost the Indian market 1,000 rupees per kilo. That's something like uh, $20. We can sell at $20 per kilo, okay. this material. So you, do you know then which markets that allows you to, to enter and have you begun to make entries into those markets? Yes. Okay, <laughs> wonderful. So, and, and the total volume then that you think that, I mean, are, are we talking about a market that's in... We have, we have that, one company, we have one company in India making in a pilot plant scale okay. this, uh, this cellulose. Depending on the nature of starting material, if you start with the choir, you know, the amount of cellulose in choir is something like 40%. And you don't get the yield is actually something like 10% of yield. But if you use, I mean, pineapple leaf fiber or a banana fiber, you get a pretty good yield, something like 40, 45% of yield. So it could, it's, it's a, it could be a marketable material. And we are also doing a life cycle analysis of this. I mean, when you, when you use commercial production, we also look at the life cycle analysis. And we have a massive program to make use of, um, uh, I mean, uh, you make use of, um, Enzymatic process for the production of uh, nanocellulose. If you use enzymatic process, it becomes more eco friendly. Okay, thank you. Other questions? We still have time. Mahmoud Il Sayed from Ecole de Mindinant. Thank you very much for your uh, interesting lecture. Uh, my question is, uh, exist any applications for uh, uh, nanocellulose filter and uh, wastewater treatment, for example, uh, to remove heavy metals, also for the verification uh, of uh, water for drinking? Yeah? Yes. Okay. We, have, we have a very massive program supported by the Department of Science and Technology in India. What we are trying to do is, um, we have uh, plans to make cheap filters yeah. for water purification purpose. What we really need is we need a base material which is actually a cheap base material. It could be a 
polypropylene or it could be PET based material and then you impregnate this uh, nano cellulose viscous solution on the top surface. Yeah. And if you impregnate with uh, this, uh, this, this uh, commercial filters with nano cellulose I mean, uh, fibers, you can get, make beautiful I mean, uh, structures for water purification purposes. Similarly, if you, want to, if you want to catch bacteria and viruses, you also do a little bit of chemical modification. If you, can, if you can have some sort of positive charge on the nanocellular surface, you can, you can catch all the viruses. They're extremely small. Yeah, yeah. But bacteria, you know, simple filtration process, because the, por the porosity is so small, the pores are so small, it can catch all the bacteria. If you want to catch the viruses, you have to really treat the uh, cellular surface and make it positive. Then you can have electrostatic interaction between the, uh, the virus, which is negatively charged, and you can catch them. Uh, also we, we want to make it very cheap. We, our aim is to make cheap filters for the villages. Okay. Exist also any uh, application for the non, uh, for the cellulose filters uh, on the cars for the motors to make a verification for the yes yes, the yes 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 okay. yes okay this is very yes. interesting. Okay. Thank you very much. There's a Giselle. How to get to you? I'm to ask. Let me see. Thank you very much for your very interesting presentation. I have one question about the use of these nanofiber f in the medical applications. Did you have already, uh, did you already ask the medical uh, domain if they would be accepted to uh, use this kind of uh, material uh, because it's also important to know it's there are very good application for the release I understand that you can release some medication very slowly but what about the rest I mean if, if you keep it in your body and how is it going to affect the human being very interesting question when you use medical grade nanocellulose you have to be extremely careful you have to remove all the acid moieties it has to be accept accepted by the doctors. So we have done a few, uh, a few studies. One, a cooperation with the Brazil, which I showed you. We made some implants. Actually, it took almost eight years to do lots of animal studies. And um, the medical group in, uh, in Brazil, we could work together, and we made some implants using polyurethane. Right now, we have two ambitious programs going on. One is own healing dressing material, cheap own healing dressing material by using nanocellulose. Second one is the drug release, sustained drug release. Now we are working with the animal model, I mean with the doctors. I'm sure that within four or four years we'll be able to give you very nice results, very fascinating material. Similarly, we did some animal model for, uh, for uh, I mean, burn injuries. You know, uh, it's quite fascinating. The, the cell growth is so rapid because it's extremely porous material. I'm sure that uh, within a few years we'll be able to uh, do very good work and which could be scalable to, to use for commercial applications. Thank you very much. Still time for one question. Maria. Okay. Thank you. Congratulations for a very nice presentation. One question. We, we talk about the uses. What about regeneration of this material? When you use it for cleaning water, wastewater or heavy metals or whatever, how do you re regenerate the material or we throw it away? So one beauty of this material is uh, they're essentially biodegradable in the long run. Of course, they are quite crystalline. If you look at the nanocellulose, nanocellulose has got amorphous and crystalline parts. And we've, we did some biodegradation studies. They are biodegradable over a long run. And if you look at, uh, I mean, these own healing resonance, own healing applications, I mean, you can remove this, uh, this, uh, this, this uh, tape after a few months when the cells grow. And some of the applications we found that, especially for polyurethane processes, this is actually five or four percent of nanoscale material in polyurethane. I mean, this, is, this will last for many years because the heart valve has to start for many years. So depending upon the end use application, we can tailor make this material. These are all biodegradable. In some of the applications, you can remove this material from the body, 
when the tissues have grown. So you can tailor make this material. Thank you. Let's thank, uh, thank you so Professor much. Sabu Thomas for. Uh, thank you, sir. So it was really worth waiting for 11 years to get you here. As you have seen, it was an exciting prospect and uh, ideas on the tremendous utilization of uh, nanocellulose. Thank you, Sabu, again. So, we're going to move to the parallel session tracks. Uh, we have uh, five sessions going on. Before you leave the room, I just want to let you know the session will end at uh, 12.30. On the way to the restaurant, we're going to have a conference group photo outside of the building. Okay? Please wait until we get together to have a memory and a souvenir of this time. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of the day.